Many years ago, an African man carried out one of the grandest frauds in history. You probably would think this is one of those regular fraud stories. Out of his village, he made a promise to him to be one of the wealthiest men alive. One day, he met with a general, which was the beginning of everything. Sit tight for what you're about to hear. Long before he secured that meeting, he'd been a king of petty scams, posing as either a banker or diplomat, accumulating bills he never intended to pay. Yes, he gathered so many enemies through all these. He had been to jail several times and escaped in the most creative way possible. On one occasion, he faked a cardiac arrest to escape being jailed. On another occasion, he asked arresting officers to take him to the bank so he could withdraw money to pay his medical bills. And somehow, he escaped through a hole below a latrine. A creative con artist he was, truly. When he got jailed again for one of his frauds, he managed to secure that meeting with the general. And that's just where the real exciting story about this man kicks right off. He declared himself the custodian of an imaginary trust fund worth billions. This man had investors trooping in with their luggage and every ounce of determination on their faces. We are talking about investors worldwide. Ghana, South Korea, America, and Britain. They put in their all, hoping for huge returns. Little did they know their money was long gone. In time, his scam made much progress that could fund the lifestyle he'd always desired. Finally, that little boy from the poor village could live his luxurious dream. He became an international playboy, with women of many kinds swooning all over him. He drove the latest cars and hired bodyguards to guard his step. He felt untouchable and his scam business infallible. Unfortunately, like many other stories, it always ends at some point. His shady schemes caught the attention of the people who felt something was off and went digging about the source of his wealth. This story about the most incredible con man that graced the earth isn't just fascinating, but would leave you astonished as to how a person could carry out a scam that huge for an extended period. Ghana's independence made way for local opportunists and greedy individuals to do away with the remaining assets that weren't already stripped by the colonial powers. They employed various methods, including corrupt business practices, fraudulent schemes, and illicit dealings. These individuals took advantage of gaps in regulations, exploiting loopholes to enrich themselves at the expense of the nation's resources and development. Additionally, some colluded with foreign entities to siphon off wealth and evade accountability. Today's story digs into one of the opportunists, John K. Blamiza, a Ghanaian man who ran one of the longest serving scams in history. He easily fits in as a contender for the world's greatest con artist. He crafted a narrative of his journey from Ghana to Philadelphia, presenting himself as a proud graduate of Penn with a medical degree, claiming prestigious family ties to influential Ghanaians, including a Supreme Court justice and the nation's first president, Kwame Nkrumah. He claimed a lucrative fund supposedly created by Nkrumah himself, offering access for the right price. In reality, none of these were true. Blaine Maiza didn't have a secret fund or influential connections. Nevertheless, his elaborate fabrication managed to deceive hundreds of individuals across the globe, leading them to invest millions of their own money into his fraudulent scheme. This is how his real story goes. His real name was John Kalora Blay, and he was born into a poor home in Ghana in 1941. His poor background was the catalyst to make something of himself. As a boy, Blay Miza hustled hard, hawking kerosene in glass bottles to pay for a good school. This earned him his nickname, Kerosene Boy, back then. Blay Miza was brilliant, exceptional, and with great interest, studied what money and power looked like. All these were part of his character development for the bigger things he had to accomplish. An overzealous Blay Miza moved to the United States and finally settled in Philadelphia where he claimed he was following the path of Quaim Nkrumah by studying at the University of Pennsylvania. But the truth is, he worked as a waiter at the Union League Club, serving and washing dishes. About a year later, 
he lost his job. Blay Miza assumed the identity of his former roommate and shared with his family and newfound friends in America that he was enrolled in college at Penn. Following the trend of African immigrants pursuing higher education in the welcoming city of Philadelphia, this was just the beginning of his many lies. And as funny as it sounds, people went with the lies for the longest time. People always believed Blay Miza. He was brilliant and always had an expression that would make people never doubt him. We are sure that was probably one of the reasons he was hardly ever caught. Right after returning to Ghana in 1963, Blay Miza made a vague claim about a threat to the then president's life, President Nkrumah. He was subsequently arrested and sent to prison. But later in 1966, after a coup overthrew Nkrumah, Blay Miza was released from jail. It may look like this is all it is to this man's story, but this is just a tiny chip off the big chunk. His story gets more interesting as we go on. Years out of prison, Blade Niza still returned to his old ways. Clearly, his time spent in prison didn't tame him. He was more ambitious than ever. He was determined to get better at his scams and pull off something more significant and better. He faked many more personalities, trying to get better than the last. In the 1970s, he once claimed to be the functionary of the African Development Bank and a medical doctor, and on another occasion, he claimed to be the son of a known jurist. All these were exciting to him, but con artists never get enough. They always want more, and that's what Blay targeted. Blay Niza got tired one day and thought about returning to Philadelphia. This time, he returned pretending to be a diplomat on a Ghanaian mission to the United Nations. When he got back, he stayed at the Bellevue Stratford Hotel. While posing as a diplomat, he kept accumulating bills he had no plans to pay. This allowed him to live lavishly without taking responsibility for the growing debts. One day, he finally ran out of luck and got busted. The hotel had found out something about him. They found out he wasn't who he claimed to be. They asked him to pay up what he owed. Blay, of course, didn't have the money. The Ghanaian mission refused to pay the bill of about $2,700 which he had accumulated with a Fox personality. After all was said and done, Blay Miza was sent to jail again, as if that was where his whole life revolved around. While in prison, this time, Blay Miza was still unrepentant. It was as if he grew more determined each time he was sent to jail, and this time, he seized every opportunity to acquire every skill he needed to pull off the most significant fraud schemes in history. He emulated the habits of certain high prisoners, networking with influential individuals, and setting the ground for his future con jobs because he knew he wouldn't be in prison forever. Somehow, this man knew his way around prisons and always found his way out, making it a fascinating thing about him. Some would call it luck. Others would say it is some magic. Whatever it may be, Blay Miza was probably grateful because he always got out despite being caught so many times. The main fraud story of John A.K. Blay Miza shook scam history and still has tongues wagging any time it's being heard. While he was in prison for fraud, somehow, he managed to secure a meeting with General Ashingpong, Ghana's military dictator. In the meeting, Blay Miza told the general that ex-president Gwaine Nkrumah was his friend from youth. By the way, Blay was 20 years younger than Krumah. His boldness and audacity were out of the world. Telling all that to a military general isn't something anyone can just do without batting an eye. Blay Miza had that fierceness in him, and the general saw it. That's probably a trait with con artists. Things became more serious when Krumah, on his deathbed, entrusted a great secret to Blay Miza. He told Blay that he had pocketed huge sums equivalent to hundreds of billions of dollars in gold bars, about $27 billion, and kept them in a Swiss bank. Blay claimed that only he could access and restore the fortune. However, there isn't any evidence that Nkrumah and Blay are so close to each other. These were all his claims, and people ran with the story. He made it super convincing. You just have to believe it. A massive idea had dropped in Blay Miza's head. 
he had birthed the idea of running the trust fund, an imaginary one. For something as big as that, it definitely can't take place in secret. There must be plans, investments, and investors, or should we call them victims? Out of desperation, General Achin Pong, seeing how much Ghana's economy was tanking, called for the release of Blay Miza and granted him a diplomatic passport. This allowed Blay Miza to travel the world securing investment in the trust fund, Omen Ghana Trust Fund, as he named it. Blay Miza recruited investors to help retrieve the gold, promising them huge investment returns. He needed investors to help him hire lawyers so he could have access to the funds. The man managed to get over $200 million from American investors before his deception was uncovered in the early 90s before he got caught. Blay Miza got investors in different countries, including Ghana, South Korea, America, and Britain. They trusted him and were committed to doing business with Blay. Initially, Blay Miza set up an office for the Bureau of African Affairs and Industrial Development, an import-export company meant to mimic a legitimate government agency. Operating from their base in Bala Sinwid, Ellis, Blay Miza's American associate, and Blay Miza attracted new investors to the Omen Ghana Trust Fund. Many of these investors were lawyers or business owners who promised lucrative contracts with the Ghanaian government. However, as the scheme continued, college students and elderly widows were also drawn in. All were assured that their investment would assist Blay Miza in dealing with the government to bring the money to Ghana, with promises of returns ranging from tenfold to twentyfold. When the initial payment date passed, excuses were made, promises of even greater returns, and requests for additional funds. The funny thing is, people still didn't detect anything funny. Instead, more people trooped into the investment. This got Blay even more excited and caused him to be much more extravagant. Many of those who invested in the Omen Ghana Trust Fund might have initially been familiar with Ghana or West Africa, making the opportunity seem reasonable and aligned with their knowledge. However, as the investment pool expanded, it likely became an attractive option for individuals driven by greed, financial surplus, or a willingness to take risks. Some may have harbored a deep desire or optimism to use their money for a significant purpose. In a particular event, Blay Miza had set out to meet with his investors in Guernsey. They trooped in with their coats, luggage, and stern determination on their faces. Finally, the trust fund would pay out, so they were told. But these groups of supporters didn't have much excitement written all over them. This was not the first time they had said that. It was almost as if an ounce of excitement died each time they were told the trust fund would be paying out. They had been hearing the same thing over and over again for years. That was enough to kick off every form of happiness left in them. They had hope in him and believed nothing could go wrong, which was their first mistake. Earlier that day, Blay got to Guernsey before the investors and stayed in a suite at La Grande Mer, a new hotel on the West Coast. He had his secretary from Philadelphia, Mary Lou Valianote, land earlier too. She helped receive new arrivals, ushering them in through the white double doors into Blaze's suite, and the group sat on the plush sofas in anticipation of the upcoming meeting. Among them was Walter Hajduck, a businessman from New Jersey who had a dispute with Peter Rigby, Blaze Miza's associate in handling financial matters. EDM Stephen, the police officer assigned by the Ghanaian government to oversee Blay Miza's international travels was sipping his milky tea, and athlete Kim Chung Han translated for the South Korean investors present. The investors all sat patiently, anticipating the big news. That was all that mattered at that point. In another relatively smaller sitting room, Blay Miza put on a simple red patterned shirt and light slacks and warmly greeted his guests all in dark wool suits, a stark contrast in attire. He always loved to put on some sort of sophistication anywhere he went. Guernsey felt wet and cold, and so were their expressions. He initiated the Ghanaian national handshake, a shake followed by a click. This handshake showed deep respect in Ghanaian culture. He demonstrated this gesture to Ian Reid, 
the British investor who owned a construction company. During their short stay, the investors spent most of their time in their suites, exchanging gossip and going out into the rain-soaked island while eagerly anticipating any developments on the payout. Even though Blay Misa stayed in hotels frequently, he disliked their food, except for cakes. So he always traveled with his chef, who brought ingredients from Ghana and cooked exclusively for him. On this occasion, the chef brought garden eggs and a cranty. He often had his chef cook in the hotel's kitchen, which worried the staff. He spent so much money, and no one dared question him. Then again, after all the time spent doing almost nothing in particular at Guernsey, Blamiza conveyed that the funds were still inaccessible, causing another setback for the group. This sent disappointment to the investors. Again, they had spent their time, only to be disappointed, as usual. The whole act felt like a deliberate attempt to waste and buy time. Blay had no intention of releasing funds to this group. Of course, he never intended to release their funds, and that's what they failed to realize. Each they had a meeting like this, they ended up being given an excuse. They took so many excuses that they were almost used to it. But this is money we're talking about. No one gets used to excuses like that. This meeting particular meeting got them wondering. He packed his trunks and returned to London, with the investors reluctantly trailing behind. That was how crazy it was. They followed him like they had no sense of direction. Some investors couldn't hide their discomfort any longer, as this was becoming alarming. This was not the first, nor the second time. Just like he always did, he didn't provide many details about what went wrong. During the journey back to London, the investors speculated wildly. They all finally agreed that since Blay Misa was a financial expert, the problem must have been due to some obscure banking regulation or something similar. They used this to put their minds at rest. Deep inside them, they were concerned and worried about the situation. They worried but were too scared to tell. They only expressed their concerns to each other, but still didn't make them give up on Blay. They still trusted him so much. Reed, the British investor, believed that the funds had been stuck in multiple banks for many years. Hadduck said there used to be 16 banks, but now it is down to five. He explained that with 27 billion 800 million, each of the 16 banks previously involved would have had around one and a half billion. Now the money was consolidated into five banks, including Butterworth, which was relatively unknown. Had Duck confused Butterworth with an American syrup brand, clarifying that it was the government's bank, the bank of N.T. Butterfield and Son in Bermuda. He speculated that these banks had loaned out the trust fund money and were struggling to recover it, resulting in investor delays. He calculated the wait to be around 50 bank days, equivalent to over 70 days, including weekends, for the funds to be accessible again. They made all these speculations so that they wouldn't have to think something different. A few could sense something but must have shrugged it off. These speculations were all they used to bring themselves together. No one gave them a reasonable explanation. They had the liberty of thinking far and wide, but they decided to keep it within that. Reed expressed concern about the prolonged wait and was unsure if they could endure it. As his agitation grew, his cockney accent became more pronounced. He fretted over the prospect of meeting payroll and lamented the exhaustion of their available credit cards. In response, Hadduck remained indifferent and unconcerned about Reed's decision-making. Of course, some like this would attract different eyes. Blade Miza's lifestyle kept people wondering. Eyes were on him, especially with the whole trust fund thing. Investigators across three continents were probing Blake Miza and his American associate, Robert Ellis. Still, investors were becoming more open to cooperating with them. No one understood how this was still happening. It felt like some spell was cast on them. On the one hand, people were complaining about the funds they hadn't received, while on the other hand, more people wanted to become investors. This is someone no one would ever understand. The scam kept going on for a long time. People drop in their last penny to have it doubled and never receive it back.
But then came the downfall of the con artist from an attempt to scam Gerard Bank, a former financial institution. Blaine Niza filled each for $50,000 and counterfeited signatures using blank traveler's checks from an assistant branch manager. Later, one of his associates tried to cash them at a Deutsche Bank branch in Germany. However, both banks caught wind of the deception. In response, Blay Miza fled Philadelphia and never returned. This still didn't stop him from running his scam. He felt unstoppable and focused on wooing investors and seeking favors in Ghana and London. Meanwhile, the assistant branch manager faced arrest, bearing the consequences alone. Ellis's operation in Philly persisted until state prosecutors apprehended him in 1986, fed up with Blay Miza's excuses, an investor named Barry Ginsburg, a Philadelphia lawyer, reached out to an assistant district attorney. Ellis faced arrest in January and appeared in court that spring for trial before Judge Lynn Abraham. Described as a tough individual who carried a gun, drank plenty of coffee, and strongly advocated for the death penalty, Judge Abraham later became Philadelphia's first female attorney general in 1991. Prosecutors calculated that around 300 individuals in the greater Philadelphia region fell prey to the scheme. However, these were only the individuals willing to come forward, and astonishingly, many of them still held on to belief in the con. Many still believe he was a financial genius, and the money was stuck somewhere they couldn't access. Nothing explains why they'd hold a belief in him. It's unreal. Together, they had suffered losses exceeding $15 million. Yet this amount paled compared to the $100 million reportedly swindled by Blaine from victims worldwide. On April 8, 1987, Judge Lynn Abraham's courtroom was again crowded. Ellis and his attorney, Anthony Defino, stood opposite prosecutors Joseph Casey and William Wolfe. Investors filled nearly every seat behind them. Judge Abraham, who had studied African history in college, saw through Ellis's tales. She described the case as one of the most intriguing and intricate legal matters. Reflecting on Ghana's history, Judge Abraham noted that President Nkrumah was either the nation's greatest benefactor or its most notorious thief, depending on whose account one believed. An arrest warrant was issued for Blay Misa, but he had already vanished. Ellis later admitted guilt and received a prison term of 5 to 15 years. In 1992, the same year Blay Misa supposedly died in Accra under house arrest, Ellis faced another indictment for tax evasion. Doubts persist regarding Blay Misa's demise due to his history of deceit and fabricated ailments. Only when the government obtained fingerprints from his body, at the FBI's insistence, was his death confirmed. Despite overwhelming evidence debunking the existence of the ill-gotten millions, many of Blade Miza's supporters stubbornly cling to the belief that the fortune is still hidden. The scheme ensnared not only ordinary Philadelphians, but also prominent figures like nightclub owner Ben Bynum and even John Mitchell, the former U.S. Attorney General tainted by his involvement in Watergate. The lure of the imaginary treasure stashed away in Swiss vaults, capable of lifting Ghana out of its historical struggles, captivated countless individuals, promising boundless riches. Most people couldn't believe their hard-earned money was gone in a twinkle of an eye. They all got to see Blay most of the time throughout before he got caught, but they never got an explanation as to what happened to their money. Lives got ruined, and people got depressed over what they thought would be a life-changing opportunity for them. Despite getting in trouble with the law and spending some time in jail, Blade Miza always found a way to avoid getting caught. He kept chasing after money and power, creating more significant lies and tricks to fool people. But like in many stories of pride and dishonesty, Blade Miza's luck ran out. Investigators finally caught up with him, and his greed got the best of him. His scams ruined many lives and dreams, showing how much damage financial fraud can cause. Yet, even in the mess he created, Blay Miza's story teaches an important lesson about being careful with our ambitions and not falling for easy promises of wealth. It reminds us always to question things that seem too good to be true and honest in our dealings. 
Ultimately, Blay Mizas' legacy warns us to be cautious and ethical when it comes to money and investments. We've come to the end of this story. Thanks for staying till the end. Make sure you hit the subscribe button for the next.